Evening, guys. Good to be with you. I know you still don't feel comfortable using the women's restroom, do you? We better not catch you going in there. That's just what, that's just what I'm saying. You walk in there, you're like, I know I'm not supposed to be in here, even at a men's conference. So that's what I thought, anyways, when he said that. So, anyways, uh, hey, do what you got to do. So, let me tell you a little bit about me, um, uh, not because I have a need to talk about myself, but to set some context to let you know who I am. Um, been married for 23 years. I have four kids. I think there's a slide of my family. Uh, for you guys that are military, I'm sorry about my son's long hair. Um, but, you know, if you're ever going to grow your hair long, I guess it's when you're 18 and a freshman in college. And so this is my family, four kids. Freshman in college, Andrew, Ashley, who's a sophomore in high school, and Jackson. So Andrew played high school basketball, was very good. You can tell he's quite tall. Ashley plays in the marching band. We don't know where that came from because we didn't do that, but she enjoys that. And then Jackson on the end is 13. He is a surfer. Uh, we live close to the beach. He runs six six minute miles. That's pretty fast. And uh, he's a cross country runner and a surfer. And then our little one is Kinsey. She's 11 and she's the baby of the family. So it's, and my wife, Chandra. So you guys can take that off uh, the screen now anyways. But, but a little bit of background on me. I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. I grew up in an inner city neighborhood, Spanish speaking neighborhood predominantly, kind of a rough neighborhood. I didn't know it was rough at the time. I just knew it was my neighborhood. And I grew up playing, playing sports. I was an athlete growing up. I played high school football and high school basketball. I was, I was a little bit more passionate about basketball growing up. And I remember in my neighborhood that whenever I played basketball at a little elementary school every night called Keeling Elementary. And there were about three of us that were white people at Keeling Elementary that played basketball there. So like seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, I could never get in the game. And I, I remember like, I don't think this is a real safe environment because every time Fat Kenny wanted his ball back, he would pull out his gun and he would take a shot in the air. And that was just, we just knew when Fat Kenny pulls his gun out, you better give him his ball back because he has the best ball. So that's the neighborhood that I grew up in. I didn't realize until later that that was a little bit of a crazy neighborhood. Um, grew up and was not interested in a relationship with God when I was growing up. By the time I was a sophomore in high school, I was experimenting with all the crazy stuff that you can experiment with and and uh, had, had joined a, uh, a group. I can't really call it a gang, you know, I guess, because it, we didn't shoot anybody, but we beat up people and those sorts of things, you know, and just spent my high school years uh, not interested in a relationship with God at all. Got a scholarship to the University of Arizona because I had a 3.2 grade point average in high school. And back then, apparently that was good enough to get you into college for free. And today, some of you wish, I wish that could happen now, but apparently we didn't have very many scholars in Arizona. And a 3.2 in Arizona, which by the way, in my high school, a 3.2 was like you showed up three days out of the week, you know, to get a 3.2. So that's about how it was. And so went to University of Arizona my freshman year. And I got a letter in the mail one day that said, your scholarship has been revoked and you're no longer welcome to be a student at the University of Arizona. I'd failed all of my classes because I was partying and I was hanging out and I was just, you know, newfound freedom, going to college, lost my scholarship. What do I do now? Sign up for the military. Any of you have that story? All right. Can a couple of you? All right. So I signed up for the military to get some respect back, you know, uh, is what I felt like I was doing. And my recruiter lied to me. Amen. Any of you ever? <laughs> my recruiter, in fact, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say this. I spent my first six week, of, six week of boot camp scheming for how when I get out of boot camp, I would kill my recruiter. <laughs> I, re I really was. I was like, this is not at all what he said. I remember he was like, yeah, you have to give up hot showers for a week or two. Anyway, so I went to basic training. Now, it wasn't a real basic training because it was the Navy, right? So it wasn't the Marine Corps, but it was, it was the Navy. So I went to basic training in San Diego, got out. But during my basic training time, I came to know Christ as my Savior. So that was the time that, you know, if, you, if some of you, Ty told me some of you were military, so those, those basic, that basic training time is a little bit of a soul-searching time where you're going, how did I end up here? Now, some of you really plan to end up there, and some of you, like me, ended up there by accident, didn't really plan it, and thought, what am I doing here? Uh, but God really used that, uh, became a Christian in boot camp, got out and thought, time to serve the Lord now. Time to serve the Lord. Now, all these years later, you know, I, I did a stint at Desert Storm. I left the Navy and moved over to the Marine Corps side, corpsman with the Marine Corps, 2nd Battalion, 23rd Marines, Infantry Battalion, went to Desert Storm, was in a 
disabled veteran now the whole bit, which is awesome because in California you can buy a house and your kids go to college for free. So I always tell my kids, I gave my left arm, looks okay now, but it wasn't okay back in the day, so that you could go to college for free. So, so now, you know, I, I, for 25 years now, I've been a pastor. I've started several companies. I own a couple of companies right now. I, uh, I, I coach and train pastors all across the country. I work with uh, professional athletes. I have one particular client who coaches uh, really probably about the 10 top basketball players in the world. So he, he's an NBA shooting coach. So I'll get to go sit on the sidelines at games and that sort of thing. So basically what I do is I, 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 uh, I help people be more successful in terms of running organizations and businesses, but all but with a gospel-centered emphasis. And just a couple years ago, I started focusing on really helping because I planted a church and it grew to be a large church like this one, started really focusing on helping Acts 29. And this church is an Acts 29 church as well to see more churches planted in the Western United States. I've spent, um, you know, I pastored churches from 12 people because I planted a church that grew to be about 800 people. And I pastored a church of 4,000 people for a number of years. So I pastored large churches and smaller churches. And so uh, that, that just tells you where I'm coming from. I won't talk about me for the rest of the weekend, but just to, that just gives you a little bit of an idea. We live 10 miles inland from Laguna Beach where it's cheaper to live, but still fairly cool in Orange County. We live in a city called Rancho Santa Margarita, which is you know near Mission Viejo, if you know where that is. All right, great to be here with you guys. Here's what we're gonna do this weekend. We're gonna do five things. Now, I speak all the time and at conferences and, and in many situations and I didn't phone it in for this conference. So I just want you to know that I told Ty, I spent dozens of hours writing new topics, writing, writing fresh uh, talks and sermons for you guys, even though I'll speak at a lot of conferences this fall because I really, I know Ty really well. I saw your building when the floor was still gravel because I was here hanging out with Ty. And I really wanted to prayerfully consider what can, I, what can I challenge you guys on? I'll speak at three men's retreats in the next three weeks, and I focused particularly on this in terms of what, what does it look like holistically to be a man? What does it look like to be a man of God? So that's my first topic, what God asks of you, what it means to be a godly man. The second one, people have been making fun of me on Twitter, it's what women need from you, how to love a woman. All right, there were a lot of jokes today about that because some of you were like, that sounds scandalous. But I want to teach you whether you're a, you might be married. I'll talk to you about what it looks like to love a woman. And if you're single and you're saying, the church always talks to married guys, no, I'm going to talk to you as well. All right, what does it look like to be a single guy in right relationships with women? The third session will be tomorrow morning. It's what your family needs from you, how to be a man at home. All right, so I'm 23 years now of marriage. My oldest son is a freshman in college. I've been parenting a long time. My, my oldest son will travel with me oftentimes. I didn't bring him this weekend, but, but my, my kids have heard me speak many times and they'll tell you our dad is what he says he is. So I don't stand in front, pretend to be something, and then don't practice that at home. So I'm gonna challenge you tomorrow on what that looks like. And then tomorrow also, we're gonna look at what your church needs from you, how to be a part of a church, all right, I don't, and Ty didn't put me up to this. He didn't say, would you please kick our men in the rear so that, you know, that's not it at all. And then lastly, what your neighbors need from you, how to live on mission, all right? Uh, and we just, just uh, Sunday night, I did my fantasy football draft with my neighbors. Uh, I finished in last place last year. I don't know how that happened because I had the first draft pick. And I finished in last place nonetheless because I had really bad luck, even though I'm a super good fantasy player, maybe not. So this, this year, every Sunday, I have to hang a flag that's five feet by 10 feet in front of my garage that's pink that says fantasy football loser with my name engraved on it. Now, why would I spend $125 of my money to be in a fantasy football league that I know I'm going to lose? Because I spent seven hours with my neighbors last Sunday night. We did our draft and then afterwards we had all the families together and then we did a little poker tournament with all the guys and four of the women stayed around and and at midnight, I was the last sober guy in the group, so I checked out and came home with all the money, because if you say sober, anyways. Uh, but my point is, is we've spent four years since we bought this house where we live now, living intentionally with our neighbors, and have had a massive impact on our neighborhood. So I'll talk to you about what that looks like tomorrow, all right? Now, let me dive in now in terms of what we're going to look at tonight. I want to ask you a question. Why are you here this weekend? Something caused you to sign up for this weekend. 
Uh, maybe you're here because you have some interest in Christianity. Maybe you're here because you're a passionate follower of Jesus. Maybe you're here because you go to anything that, that, that you have an opportunity to sign up for. Maybe you're here, you didn't really want to come, but somebody said to you, maybe you should come to this, it would be good for you. Sometimes when I speak, I'll meet people that somebody dragged them along. I didn't really want to come, but, you know, my son made me come or my dad really wanted me to come to this. Why are you here? All right. For, for some reason, you're willing to come to a Christian experience this weekend. We just stood and looked at five guys who played music and they sang to us and we sang back. That's kind of weird, isn't it? I did that at a Coldplay concert last uh, Friday night, but I mean, we do that in society, but but at the same time, like you came to a Christian experience this weekend, all right? So what is Christianity? What even is Christianity? Let me give you a few thoughts on this. Some people see Christianity as a philosophy. So some would say it's a philosophy. Now, others would see Christianity as a system of ethics. This is what I grew up thinking. In fact, I didn't want to be a Christian because I thought Christianity is one big system to keep me from doing things that are really fun in life. I coach a, a guy who's a, I have a, a client, a coaching client who won two championship rings with the Lakers. And so he shared the gospel of Shaquille O'Neal many times. And I'll, I'll be in the car with him and Shaq will call him on the phone and he'll hold up his phone and show me. That's pretty, like, I'm like, give me the phone. Let me answer the phone. You know, that's what I want to do. He's never let me, but I'll ask him, you ever share the gospel of Shaquille O'Neal? He'll say, yeah, I have. Are these guys in the NBA interested in the gospel? He says, so many of them just think Christianity is a system of ethics. It's a system of rules. And you might go, yeah, I, re I remember the rich young ruler story. Like, you, you have to give up stuff to be a Christian, right? But see, a lot of people think Christianity is about keeping a set of rules, all right? So some people see Christianity as an experience, all right? So, some people see Christianity as going to church. Until I was 35, from like 21 to 35, I played basketball four mornings a week at a local gym. We called it old man basketball because it was the guys that would get up before work early enough to play at like five in the morning. And so there were not 19 year old guys there because they didn't want to get up that early. And, and, and everybody knew I was a Christian because if you play basketball with people four days a week for 11 or 12 years, you sit afterwards and talk and, and, and in time, everybody knew I was a Christian. And so over the course of time, I had the opportunity to influence a lot of those guys. And, and you know what they would say to me sometimes? They would say, man, we got to get back to church. Because they saw Christianity as going to church. Now, Christianity is an experience, is a philosophy, involves church, and does have ethical considerations, yet none of these things truly explain Christianity. In fact, I wonder if I asked you tonight, we could do this, but I wonder if I asked you tonight, what is Christianity? If I'd get 10 different answers in the room. Let me give you a basic definition of what Christianity is at its core. At its core, Christianity is a transaction between a person and the God who created the universe. All right? So a person who, be, a person who becomes a Christian moves from knowing about God in some distant way to knowing God experientially, directly, and intimately. You catch that? I'm going to read it one more time because I want you to have that in your head as we go on. Christianity at its, at its core is a transaction between a person and the God who created the universe. A person who becomes a Christian moves from knowing about God in some distant way to knowing God experientially, directly, and intimately. You're not Christian because you go to church. And you're not Christian because you live right. It doesn't make you Christian. And you're not Christian because you like the philosophy of Christianity. None of those things make you a Christian. To be a Christian is to actually know God. It's to know God. John 17, 3 says, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. All right, so Christianity is essentially knowing God. Christianity believes in a God that created us, wants to know us, wants to know you personally wants to know you. You, you, you. you might have, you know, ha having been in pastoral ministry for so many years, I've met with so many hundreds of people. I mean, I did ministry with street kids for five years. 
For five years, I worked with kids who lived on the street in Huntington Beach, California. They called them street rats. If you ever have spent time in that area, they hang around Main Street, get tattoos at illegal tattoo places, a lot of drug addiction. I spent five years working with kids who felt like they were completely worthless. And the, the key to understanding value is to understand that God created you to know him. God created you to know him intimately. So claiming to be Christian, keeping a set of rules, going to church does not necessarily mean that you know God. Now it is, it is very possible that some of us in this room are casual Christians or cultural Christians, or you grew up in a Christian home, or you know all the lingo, but you, you haven't really experienced a transaction with God where you really understand what Christianity really is. And the best thing that you can do possibly, best thing that you can possibly do for yourself in this life is to make sure that you know God. Now, what I'm going to do is, and I printed you some notes here. Did you get one of these when you came in? Hopefully you did get one. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a few things that Christianity, Christianity is not, that knowing God is not. And the reason I'm going to give you these things is because these are really common uh, pop culture Christian things that people think that Christianity is, all right? Knowing God. Some things that knowing God does not mean, all right? Knowing God, number one, does not mean learning to accept myself. Knowing God does not mean simply learning to accept yourself. Some people believe that their biggest issue is that they don't think highly enough of themselves and they need to learn to believe more in themselves. So the thought behind this is, I'm really better than I think I am. Years ago, I was watching this interview with Jennifer Aniston. You know, it's been 10 years since the, the TV show Friends went off. And so if you're only 22, you would have been 12 when it went off. But if you're 30, you probably remember that show or older. I was watching an interview with Jennifer Aniston and she was saying, what would you want Matthew Perry to know? It was like that, like everybody was crying because the series, series was over. She said, I want him to know that he's okay. I just hope he knows that he's okay. We hear that message all the time in pop culture. Believe in yourself. Stay true to yourself. You're okay. Don't, tell, don't let anybody ever tell you that you need to change. You know, accept yourself. That all sounds really awesome, but none of that will get you any closer to God. Believing that you're awesome won't get you any closer to God. Accepting yourself won't get you any closer to God. The path to being a godly man is not simply that I'm okay. In fact, the Bible completely rejects this idea. Okay, conversion to Christianity begins when I realize that I'm not okay. All right, we just say that with me out loud. I'm not okay. Now say it even if you think you're awesome. All right, say I'm not okay. One, two, three. All right, now you might be now because maybe God's already saved you, but that's where Christianity starts. It doesn't start with pride and arrogance and look at how awesome I am and look at how amazing I am and look at what I've gotten done. Look at how religious I am. That's not where Christianity starts. All right, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? It's kind of a gnarly verse, isn't it? Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 3. This is who you guys were. And you were dead in trespasses and sins, among whom we all once lived in the passions of, passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Before I knew God, I wasn't okay and awesome, and I just need to learn to stay true to myself, like with this American Idol kind of thinking. All right, that's not Christianity. How about Romans 3? I don't even like to read these verses. <laughs> Verse 10 None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good, not even one, not even if you grew up in a Christian home. The venom of asps is under their lip. Wait, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. There's a lot of verses in the Bible like this. That there's a little more to it than you just need to accept yourself. All right, so when people get interviewed by Oprah, and I'm not ripping on Oprah, I've never met her, but when people get interviewed by Oprah and people are crying, and you just need to accept yourself, like that's not Christianity, okay? It's that, that won't get you any closer to God. 
All right, number two, knowing God is not the simple belief that God is love. Knowing God is not the simple belief that God is love. Now, this is all over pop culture. Also, pop culture or, or more liberal Christianity, you know, don't confuse liberal politics with liberal Christianity. They have nothing to do with each other. Okay, liberal Christianity would be a Christianity that's like void of miracles, doesn't believe in the miraculous, sees Jesus as our example, that kind of thing, but doesn't believe necessarily in substitution on the cross, that, that kind of stuff. So don't think politics here. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about liberal Christianity would say, we need to be true to ourselves, then we need to love others because God is love. Now, do we need to love others? Yes or no? Of course we do. But does loving others get you closer to God? Loving others in and of itself. You could be super loving and not be closer to God. I just, watched a, I just watched a video the other day about the Black Eyed Peas. A few years ago, I went to a U2 concert at the Rose Bowl. I've always liked U2 since I was in high school. I've seen them seven or eight times since they were a small band. And so I went to the Rose Bowl uh, and the Black Eyed Peas opened for them. And I, was, I thought, this is gonna be fun. I like the Black Eyed Peas. Well, I mean, I don't listen to them every day. I'm just like, there could be worse bands that would open. Slash came out on the stage, you know. Uh, it's kind of, he played the guitar solo, and, and, and it was kind of a fun concert. And so I'm familiar with the Black Eyed Peas. Uh, and so a couple days ago, maybe like a week ago, they released a new video. Anybody see it? It's their Where's the Love song. It's got tons of celebrities in it, like all kinds of celebrities, like pro basketball players, uh, pop singers, TV stars, movie stars, and everybody singing Where's the Love, the Black Eyed Peas song. And it's a pretty compelling song. Like you'll, you'll, you'll or at least the, the video, you'll, you'll see it and go, yeah. See, we can, be, we, can, we can think though, we just gotta be more loving, you guys. We just gotta love. Now, it is definitely true that we need to be loving. But there's way more to Christianity than God just being a God of love. In fact, God is certainly a God of love, but he's also a lot of other things. He's holy, sovereign, just, righteously jealous, and he displays wrath. I preached on the wrath of God lots of times because pe people, don't, people don't like that, like a God that's angry. That's one of the major objections that people have to Christianity. Yet the Bible says that there's more to God than him just being a God of love. We don't ever see a version of God in the Bible where God just shows up and says, hey, you guys are awesome. Do whatever you want. I'm God and I love you. And we don't see that version of God. There's other stuff there, isn't there? There's other stuff there. If we, if we see a God of love, but we don't have a greater understanding of his wrath and punishment of sin, then I'm missing out on a holistic, you know what I mean by holistic? The big picture, right? The whole picture of who God really is, all right? So I, I, I put some verses here for you that, that I'll just throw up briefly and show you that just demonstrate that God is not only a God of love. Romans 2, but because of your hard and impotent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves, on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Now, I'm not going to start sweating and get all Pentecostal on you. I'm just saying, you know, they're like, God, wrath is real in the Bible. All right, Romans 2. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. That doesn't sound very awesome, does it? There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. How about Colossians 3, 5, and 6 that says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. Now, this is to Christians, which is idolatry. On account of these, what's coming? The wrath of God. No, not on you if you're a Christian. I'm just saying, God, like, there's more to God than God is love. There's, there's, there's a, a bigger picture of God. All right, number three. Knowing God is not simply that Jesus is my example. I've already alluded to this once. All right, what does it mean to know God? It's not just, knowing God is not just that, that, uh, that, that Jesus is my example. It's not just that the simple belief that God is love. It's not just learning to, my, to accept myself. So theological liberalism, and I know it's big. You, you can hang with me on that, right? Theological liberalism would say, we just need to imitate Jesus. Imitate Jesus. Now, you know, I don't know where Bono from U2 is with Christianity. Like, I've heard him express his testimony before. Certainly hope that he knows Jesus for real. I don't know if he does or not, because, again, I don't know Bono. 
Uh, but, but sometimes you can see some of what is said in that kind of world, and it just feels like we just need to imitate Jesus. Now, I've heard Bono at times uh, give a pretty, like what is seemingly a pretty strong articulation of the, of the whole gospel. I don't really know. I just know when someone says, man, here's what Jesus did, we just need to do what Jesus did. WWJD, remember the bracelets back in the day? That's, that's not false. It's not complete. You got that? Say we got it if you do. All right, it's just not complete. It's not the whole picture. So you know, I was just, I, I lead a, I have a cohort that I teach a group of guys via video once a month. There's 12 guys on that cohort. I was just explaining to them yesterday this whole thing of saying, it's not that this is false, it's that this isn't a complete picture of how you can know God. All right, number four. No, knowing God does not mean that I simply need to clean up my act and live right. Now, we hear this all the time. This is what I get from my neighbors. You know, it's, and especially if anybody's ever gone to church before. So you guys that are military that come from the South, you know, my wife is from East Texas. She grew up in Palestine, Texas. It's in the Piney Woods, East Texas by Tyler. So I've been to the South lots of times. I even lived in the South for three years. So you know how churched the South can be. I'm good friends with Matt Chandler, who's a pastor in Texas. We work a lot together because I'm on the board of Acts 29 and all that. And so... So I know when, I, when I'm in Texas, I was in Dallas for a week this summer. There's a, it feels like there's a lot of churchianity down in that neighborhood sometimes. I was on the phone with, I coached uh, 10 of Andy Stanley's pastors for several years down in Atlanta. It feels like every time I talk to a guy from Atlanta, he's like, yeah, my church is 14,000. It was 300 people yesterday, and we grew 13,700 people since last week because it just seems like everybody in Atlanta goes to church except that guy in that video in his neighborhood. Inky, he didn't, but... but but anyways, so you hear that a lot, like, I need to get back to church. I need to clean up my act and, and live, and I need to stop swearing so much. I literally heard people say that I need to clean up my language. I'm trying not to swear so much. Who cares if you swear if you don't know God? You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get a guy to stop swearing that doesn't know God? Now you're just a non-swearing God hater, <laughs> you know? So awesome. You're a moral, you know? So it just like, Trying to get people to clean their act up and live right is not getting anybody any closer to God. So I remember being on the basketball court all those years that a guy would drop the F-bomb then apologize to me. I'm like, what are you apologizing to me for? I don't expect you to not swear in front of me. You might as well do the same thing in front of me that you do anywhere else. Okay, so when I hang out with my neighbors, which is all the time, we go on vacation with our neighbors. I go to UCLA football games with one of my neighbors. So when, we, you know, when I hang out with my neighbors, they don't clean up their language normally because they're not Christians. And I really don't even really want them to. Now, I don't want you to swear in front of my little kids. And I'll tell you, my, my kids are here. You don't have to say that in front of my kids. But believe it or not, most of the people I know don't anyways. So knowing God does not mean simply that I need to clean up my act and live right. All right, Christianity is not about trying to live a better life, to do things the right way, to be a better father, to be more faithful at church. None of that will save you. None of it. Knowing God goes much deeper than outward moral renovation. Okay, so so cleaning, if you're here this weekend and you're like, I've just been trying to get back into church, that's great, but it's not going to make you it's not going to get you right with God. And if you feel like I've got to stop drinking so much, you probably should stop drinking so much, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're closer to God, all right? Christianity is not something that we add to our lives that will make our already good suburban existence better. I mean, I go to, sometimes I visit churches in Orange County where I live and I feel like, I don't know if this is Christianity or just another, like we just come here on Sundays as another thing that we do. That's, that's not what Christianity is. Then what does it actually mean to know God? You might say, man, this is cookies on the bottom shelf for a first session, but I want to make sure. In fact, you know, just a couple weeks ago, I, I specifically went through some of this with my kids because my kids are so panicked about things like swearing. It's a different generation. When I was in high school, we just, we didn't want to keep the rules. Kids today, very different than, than 20, 25 years ago. If you have parents today, in fact, youth ministry has totally changed. Because in the 70s and 80s, you know, people didn't like their parents. If you have parents today, you feel a little bit better about it. You're like, I, I'm the only kid in my neighborhood who still has two parents who are together. Feel pretty good about that. That's what we've experienced. And I've been, I've been sharing with my kids, but it's not about cleaning up your act. It's not about not swearing. Then what does it mean to know God? 
All right? In order to know God, you must know three things. All right? Number one is who we are. Now, you might say, I already know God. I've been a Christian for a long time. Then I really want you to reflect on this because this should shape everything that you do in life. All right? First, who we are. We are God's creation. That's who we are. We're God's creation. God created us and built us for a relationship with him. You guys know how many people, I mean, you know, I was in a taxi cab yesterday. I was in a taxi cab because I came in a day early to just spend a day by myself because I never get time by myself. So I checked into the signature suites over there at the MGM Grand because I wanted to be in a non sort of casino option where I could just sit and relax. I worked all day today. And so in the taxi cab on the way yesterday, because uh, from the airport to the signature suites over there, uh, the guy in the front seat who's driving the cab tells me I used to be a professional poker player. And, and I know a little bit something about that world. I've seen the World Series online and, or whatever on TV back in the day when it was more popular. And, and so he starts telling me I played in three World Series main events. And, and uh, at one point, I won a $471,000 prize pool in a big event. And he tells me, Daniel Negron, who's one of my best friends, and he says, but I'm broke now. And so he starts to go into it. He said, he said because I'm, a, I'm addicted to alcohol and I'm addicted to drugs and I'm addicted to sex, and then he went on to describe what that meant. He said, and every time I, every time I, you know, I, I can't. And so he said, I've lost it all. The guy clearly, he's, and so yeah, I look, I'm in the backseat of the taxi cab for 14 minutes is what the GPS said because I was making sure he was going the right way, not charging me extra. And so I said to him, you know what I said to him? I said, were you abused as a kid? And he starts crying in the front seat of the taxi. I'm like, wipe off those tears and don't crash. All right, get me there. He starts crying and he says, I was horrifically abused as a kid. This just happened in my taxi ride yesterday. And I said to him, you know, God created you to know him. That's where your esteem comes from. That's what you need to know. You're God's creation. I love to say that I work with a ministry in Louisville that's kind of spread out called Scarlet's Hope. They rescue women from sexual slavery. I mean, they, they, they're infiltrating 27 different strip clubs. It's just women in this ministry. And I work with their staff team and I coach the people that run it behind the scenes because they've rescued hundreds of women from sexual slavery. And most of them were severely abused. They feel like they're worthless. You need to know that you're God's creation, that God created you. Know, you see those four kids that I put up there, my kids? I, I pray with them every night, every night that I'm home, which is most of the time. And I want them to know God created you to know him. You're God's creation. He built you for a relationship with him. We're designed to live for him. We're designed to worship him, all right? And we'll always try to worship something. If not God, then we'll, we'll, we'll worship something else, all right? We've rejected God. You need to know that as well in terms of who are we. We've rejected God. We, we, we've all chosen and reaffirmed daily to reject God and to make our own joy and happiness our top priority. Now, raise your hand if you're honest enough to say, most of my life I've made my own joy and happiness my own priority. I mean, I'm dealing with my own teenage son right now with that. It's like, it's like you know, he's a video gamer, which, which you know, drives me crazy because we didn't even have video games when I was growing up. We had like Pong, you know, and Duck Hunt, which you just can't play Duck Hunt for that long. <laughs> you know, after a while, you're like, or we had Contra. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. You remember that? B8, whatever it was. You guys remember those old school games? Now the games are like, I don't even know what you're doing, you know? So he's a gamer and he's a computer science major in college. And, 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 I'm, and I'm, constantly, I'm constantly trying to help him see that life is not about you just pursuing your own pleasure all the time, about your own comfort. But see, we choose not to worship God because we want to live for ourselves and serve ourselves. So we make our own pleasure most of the time our top priority. Because we're created for worship, we worship other things than God. So this will resonate with you probably. We center our lives on things that promise to give us meaning. Success, relationships, influence, love, comfort, ministry, music, family. All right? Because we worship these things. We reject God by worshiping these things. And this is sin. Sin's not only adultery and murder. Sin's worshiping anything other than the true God. Sin's taking something good and making it ultimate. Sex is good within the context of the way God created it. 
but making it ultimate is to worship it in his sin. All right? And we're separated from God because of this. You get that threefold, God created us. We've rejected him. I love how Tim Keller puts it. He's like, you're running toward the, toward the fire, feeling like you're headed toward the beach with sunglasses on. Like, you don't even know. You know, we've rejected him. Therefore, we're separated from God. All right? We're living in spiritual isolation, like orphans, wandering from one thing to the next to try to find happiness. All right? Trying to find satisfaction in anything else but God leads to brokenness and loss of meaning. Have any of you ever in your life felt or experienced brokenness or loss of meaning? All right? Many of us. Most of us. All right? Even if we achieve great things in life apart from God, they won't ultimately bring us satisfaction because they were ne never meant to be God's. All right, here's a second thing you need to know, to know God. That's who God is. All right, God is love. God loves us and wants us to be in relationship with him. Most people love people that love them, but God loves and seeks the good of people even who are his enemies. I mean, how many times have you kicked God in the knee in life? I mean, how many times have you bartered with God to try to get out of a bad situation or bargained with God? How many times have you said, I'm not going to look at that certain thing on the computer again only to look at that thing again 400 more times? How, how many times, how many times have you failed? How many times have you decided, I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore and you keep doing it? All right? God is love because he pursues and loves people that reject him. God is justice because God is good and loving. He can't tolerate evil. His justice demands that he not tolerate evil. So God is Jesus Christ. Jesus is God himself come to earth. He first lived a perfect life, loving God with all of his heart, soul, and mind. He fulfilled all obligation to God. He lived the life that you owed, a perfect record. Probably heard Ty preach this before. And then he died the death that we deserve to die. So, so here's, here's the key. Our sins are paid for by his death, right? And his perfect life record is transferred to our account. So God accepts us and regards us as if we've done all Christ has done. Now, that's a big deal. Let me just give you sort of a, an analogy of how this would feel. Imagine that you're standing before God on, on judgment day. And God looks at you and he says, hey, what did you do in life that would, that would make it necessary for me to let you into this eternal, perfect existence, what would you say? You'd say, nothing. It's that guy over there. It's, that, it's Jesus. That's, that's all you have to point to because God looks at Jesus' record and applies it to you. You see that? God is Jesus Christ. God regards and accepts us as if we, we've done all Christ has done. And then lastly, so... What, what you must do to know God, what must you do? You must repent. I love saying that word because people are like, repent. That's such a hardcore word. What does repent mean? It's like you're running toward one end zone and you realize it's the wrong end zone. You watched the game last night, right? I was thrilled because I don't like the Panthers, right? So, so, uh, so, so you're running toward one end zone. You ever seen somebody score a basket in the wrong basket in a basketball game or run into the wrong end zone? Like you're running toward the, and you turn around and run to the other end zone. That's what repent means. It means to change direction. It means to go the other way. All right? It, it's an admission that you've been living for yourself, worshiping the wrong things, violating God's loving laws. Now, you don't have to have been a drug dealer or a crack addict or an alcoholic or a prostitute you might have been a really religious person who was running toward the wrong end zone through your religiosity and your pride and your good works and the fact that your older sister was out partying but you stayed home and didn't do any of that or whatever. All right, you must repent, asking forgiveness, turning toward the other end zone. And then you must believe. What does that mean? What does it mean to believe? Faith is, now, it doesn't just mean to believe that God, I, I ask my kids this all the time. You know, if you've ever done family devotions, if you have kids, they know that the answer is one word to every question. They're like, Jesus. So I try to trick them. I'm like, where am I going this weekend? They're like, Jesus. See, I, I knew you weren't listening. I'm going to Las Vegas, not Jesus. All right? Some of you are like Las Vegas, right? It's a great place. So, so faith is transferring your trust from your own efforts to the efforts of Christ, it means you're no longer relying on your own efforts. You are relying on other things to make you acceptable. But now you consciously begin relying on what Jesus did 
for your acceptance with God. All right? All you need is nothing. If you think God owes me something for all my efforts, Tim Keller would say, you're still on the outside. He's a pastor that, that I read and follow. If you think God owes you something, I worked really hard for this. Man, I, I worked hard. I was in youth group. I was a youth leader. I worked hard. I served a church. Why do I have cancer? No, you don't understand. It's not about what you have done. It's not about how hard you work. It's about what Christ has done on your behalf. All right? And then when, when, when I get that, I realize I, don't, I have nothing in my merit to earn God's approval, nothing in my record to earn God's approval so I can rest in what Jesus did and ask to be accepted into God's family for his sake. All right, I'm going to say one more thing and then, and then draw a conclusion here. When God saves a person, here's what happens. Your accounts are cleared. Your sins are wiped out permanently. You're adopted legally into God's family. And then the Holy Spirit enters your heart and begins to change you into the character of God. Now, every once in a while, somebody will, um, will find me, you know, old high school friend or something like that. And I've had people stroll in when I'm preaching that knew me when I was a sophomore in high school. They'll look at me and go, that can't be you. Even if you ask my wife what I was like when she met me 25 years ago, I was rolling around in like a Raiders starter jacket because I thought I was a Raiders groupie. Seriously, I thought I was a little gangbanger back then. So you guys are about to get those Raiders starter jackets out here. Hey, you need a new brand, I'm telling you. Or if not, you're just going to attract all the criminals to Las Vegas that want to see the Raiders play. Okay, so, but so, so having that, look, God begins to change you is what he starts to do. I remember being a Christian, being, being, being at new, new, right out of boot camp, Monday night football, 50-cent beer night. You know, and I would drink like 14 of them because I was like 19 in the military and you can drink, right? 50 cent beer night. And then I would stagger back to my barracks in San Diego and try to read the Bible. I would literally do that. And, I, and you know what? I just realized it's hard to read the Bible when you're this drunk. <laughs> and you know, nobody really, ha you know, nobody really, and I, that's really true. I've said that in front of my kids and my wife's kind of embarrassed. I've said, but it's true. I just, God just was like, hey, you, you, I probably don't need to do this anymore. Easier to read the Bible when you're not drunk. You're not as prone to temptation. People do dumb things. And, and pretty soon, a few months later, it was no longer an issue because God began to change me right away, all right? Because the Holy Spirit enters your heart. Now, in conclusion, I just want to ask you, have you embraced this? Are you relying on your own record? Are you trying to get back into church? Are you trying to work real hard for God's approval? Or have you embraced this, all right? There's a couple ways to reject it. One is to live however you want. The one is to pride yourself in your own righteousness, all right? But only the humble person that sees himself as flawed and in desperate need of God can have him, all right? My, my goal to start out, we're gonna talk about a lot of practical stuff. My goal to start this is just to say, make sure this weekend while you're here that you know God. And it might be very different than the church you grew up in. You might, you might have felt like, I got to keep the rules. I got to not do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and that's not Christianity. Those are just rules. Okay? So I want to make sure that you get that and understand what it means to know God. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would stir the hearts of the men through your spirit that are here this weekend. And I pray, God, that there'd be no man here that doesn't feel compelled and touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ, by what you have done by what you've done by in sending your son on our behalf. And I pray that you would stir the hearts of these guys, that, that those who need to embrace this would, and that those, God, who have embraced this would know. I can rest in what you've done for me. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks.